let's see, I'll, I'll be giving a talk on uh, API design and QML, so let's see. Uh, in, in this presentation, I'm going to go over uh, what, what I consider to be the main types of QML APIs, the virtual component APIs, the non-digital APIs that you can uh, build with QML, as well as the general API guidelines for uh, QML. And uh, the, the design process that I personally use and an example of me using that design process to build an API. So, whoop, uh, hold on. Let's see. Let's see, uh, hold on a second. Oops. Okay. So let's see, uh, let's see if you're watching this presentation, I would uh, hope that you already know uh, what, what QML is like. So you, you have the basic uh, declarative syntax where you uh, spe specify an object and you specify its properties uh, and its and uh, functions on it, as well as the uh, signals to react to other things. So let's see. Like, like QML is generally like about the exchange of data between uh, the declarative QML side and the imperative C++ side, or uh, if you're using another language like a Python or a Go, your imperative side of the code can also be built with that. So I generally consider there to be uh, two main types of QML APIs. Uh, Let's see, the, the first is what I would like to term uh, elements, which are uh, the visual components that you can uh, see on QD Quick applications. And then let's see, there is also what I would like to term about uh, processors or uh, utility data processing components or anything else that doesn't uh, show anything visible on the screen. So, mm -hmm. let's see, hold on a second. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So uh, th there are generally uh, two main types of uh, visual components. So let's see. The first ty type is what I would like to call it uh, leaves, or uh, these are generally the end nodes and the in the, uh, what, in the tree of items in your QML programs, you generally don't put uh, other elements inside these elements. These are your controls like uh, buttons, checkboxes, and etc. Let's see, you also have uh, the branches that are uh, components that are generally used for putting other components in, such as the layouts and, and other miscellaneous components like the Kirigami page pool and... <laughs> Let's see. So first, I'll cover some uh, specific considerations for uh, designing uh, leaves. Like, si since the leaves in your public QML APIs are most likely going to be uh, controls, let's see, like, it's generally a good practice to either inherit from the control type found in Qt Quick Components 2 or the abstract button type if your element is for clicking. So mm -hmm. let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, users of controls expect that uh, controls should have appropriate sizing set automatically based on the input of the properties that you use in the API. So let's see, like sizing is generally exposed to the implicit and with and height properties. Let's see, like, like what you do not want to do when uh, creating a digital control is to expose by to the well, with and height properties as a uh, Layouts often change these. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Let's see, uh, as the width and height are often changed by external layouts, let's see, the, the, the content and its padding should dictate the implicit width and height of the control. Like in 99% of cases, the background of the control should be uh, subservient to its size and shouldn't really affect the size of the control. Let's see. 
Let's see, your control should be able to handle whatever a developer throws at it without looking broken, even if, even if, if, even if it does look a little bit weird. You should also be mindful of options that inheriting from another type ring to the public API. For example, if you inherit from the abstract button type, you, your, your control should be able to handle all the clicking and the checkable types of the button. Let's see, and then. Uh, on the other side of things, you have uh, what, I, what I call the branch control. So these are generally APIs that are used for managing other components, like the layout, such as the column layout, which uh, arranges items in the column, or components that manage construction and destruction of other components, like repeaters or the Kirigami page router. Uh, let's see, branch components can also make use of uh, attached properties for exposing additional APIs like, for example, uh, layouts use the layout attach property to expose stuff like a preferred height and width as well as whether you want to fill height or width or not. <laughs> Let's see. For, for layouts, it's expected that you set a sensible default property so that the user of your API can simply put the items inside the parent item and the in their program source code instead of needing to explicitly specify a channel property. Let's see, like, if you're building a layout and that uh, layout has a special role such as a header or footer, you should uh, generally expose these as their own properties. Let's see. For, for uh, let's see, uh, for specific purpose APIs where you're building both the components and uh, where you're building both a parent components and the components that go inside them, you should generally be. You should generally take care to make sure that these components look like they are made to go together. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Like that generally, this means like these things should be named similarly, and let's see. It, and things that look and things that affect each other should look like they affect each other. Let's see. You can also use attached properties to uh, communicate information between the children items and the parent items. Let's see and. That's all I have to say about uh, the visual APIs, but there's also a lot more besides the uh, visual APIs in the QML world. Let's see. Uh, hold on a second. Let's see. On the other side, on the other side of the APIs that you can build with QML are the non-visual ones. Let's see. Like for example, this is the QBS build system on this slide here. Let's see. Like when you're building a non-visual API, it's generally extremely important to know your target audience more so than when you're building like a API with visual components or QT Quick. So let's see, like, like, a, like talking about QBS, like QBS, like while having a purely declarative build system would be nice. It's pretty impractical for real-world usage. Like this knowledge of the target audience is why. QBS abandons the, the QBS build system, abandons the purely declarative side of QML and gives the JavaScript engine a lot more tools than the QML engine and Qt Quick does, such as exposing the require segment and expanding the JavaScript primitives to support things useful in build systems, such as convenient methods on the array and string prototypes. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, not common in Qt Quick, but used fairly prevalently in uh, QBS. That's what I would like to call the annotation pattern. The annotation pattern is an extension of how attached properties are used in Qt Quick, but it allows it to be more specific and encode more information used in the hierarchy. <laughs> but yeah, this pattern lets individual elements take two forms, a plain unannotated form and a larger annotated form by moving out and out to its own item. The, un the unannotated form of an item has a sensible default, while the annotated form of an item allows the user to specify more information about an element, such as uh, flagging it with tags or making its application on other parts of the script depend on a condition. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, the annotation pattern also includes using attached properties on a larger form items to provide extra information. <laughs> Let's see. But besides that, there's not much else specific to non-digital QML APIs 
it's mostly the same concepts that you see in general API design. And uh, speaking of that, there's this one quote that I really like to keep in mind when designing APIs. And it's, let's see, uh, this quote is from Rob Pike, design the architecture, name the components, and document the details. Let's see. What? Uh, hold on a second. Let's see. Let's see, uh, when designing the high level architecture of your API, do you want to think about the big picture of your API? What do you want the end result to look like? Think about how the parent components and your API interact with their child components and vice versa. What actions are the parent components are going to take on the children components? What are the children going to tell the parent about? Let's see, what do you want to expose the developers using your API? And then, after you've uh, designed your high-level API, you want to think about what do you want to name your things. What, when you're browsing a foreign code base, the names of items and properties are going to tell the reader how everything in, in the program fits together. If your names are obscure and hard to understand, readers of programs that use your API are going to have a hard time understanding uh, how everything fits together, and developers using your APIs are going to have trouble recalling what what elements they should use to fix their problems, like like components should have short names, but not names so short that it obscures their meaning. And on the other end, long names are cumbersome to type out and remember when you're writing code. A good naming convention to follow is either a single nail, such as a button, or spinner, or input, let's see. Or you can do like a noun and a verb, for example, a, Let's see, the page router manages pages by routing them, or you can use two nouns together to, for, to form your component name, such as the Kirigami page pool or the tool button. Let's see, for components with variants, for example, list items using a single adjective is used to, often used to distinguish between them. Let's see, like, for example, you'd have a baseline list item, and then you'd, if you wanted a list item to be uh, expandable, you would have that be an expandable list item, and so on. It's like a common mistake is uh, given the base component of a set an adjective such as basic or simple. Th this is redundant information that makes the name less concise, and it makes it harder to notice which components are subtypes of other components. That's it. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and finally, like, no good API is complete without good documentation. While, while uh, a good architecture and names are important for developers to be able to intuit your API, they're not a substitute for documentation. Like, documentation should first give a description of every type, and then after you fill out a description for every type, you want to describe their methods, properties, signals, and other things, and then after you and then after you've written the explanations of everything, you should generally add small, concise examples that show specific parts of your API. Let's see. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when writing documentation, do not forget that comments are also documentation. Nobody likes to read dense 1,000 line files with nary a comment to help them. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Let's see, uh, that's all the talk, but it's uh, time to explain how I apply this to designing something. So let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, every tool generally has a purpose and it aims to solve a problem. Let's see, for for the Kirigami page router API that I designed, let's see, like, like the main reason why I built this was because I noticed that uh, state management and page navigation is like all over the place. So, let's see, like, our most complex applications navigation-wise tend to hold their own solutions for navigation. For example, a Discover uses a JavaScript file with custom navigation functions for all of its needs. Like, even simpler applications like Elisa tend to do a lot of custom stuff in regards to navigation, and especially in communicating data between different parts of the application. like. Simplifying this, simplifying uh, this navigation and state management is like the problem that I wanted the page router API designed to fix. So let's see, like 
before getting into designing the API, I first wanted to see uh, what what approaches other UI frameworks use to building uh, navigation and routing. Prior art is extremely important in making sure that you design something recognizable and not totally foreign to developers. After browsing through and poking with a lot of UI frameworks, I found that I liked React and Flutter's navigation APIs the best, so I took most inspiration from them, as well as combining them with QML specific QML specific items like attached properties and the ability to build domain specific language ask APIs. This is where the first step of API design comes in, designing the architecture. Let's see. For, for the page founder, I wanted to avoid applications having to avoid their own custom navigation solution and having to manually move exposed variables up the tree. So like this influenced the main architecture of the API, the controller object responsible for navigation, managing pages, moving data between them. Let's see. Attached properties are used a lot in the page router's API to move data between them. And so between uh, deeply nested trees of components. And then after I designed a high level approach of the API, let's see, I needed to name the components since Kirigami already has components like the page and the page pool. I named the components after them. The manager object here is called the page router and the specification for a page is called a page route. Let's see. Additionally, I named the navigation functions like as a bit of a mix of a stack base such as like an array and browser navigation such as navigating to a specific link. So the methods are named types such as push route, push route from here, pop route, navigate to route, et cetera. The, let's see, I, I chose this naming to make sure that it was apparent what the components do and what, what their interactions with each other result in in the application. And then after I designed and implemented the architecture and this component, let's see, documentation was the last thing to do. Let's see, since the page router is pretty different from how navigation is usually handled, I emphasized explaining the high level, how the high level architecture works before explaining the individual details. I provided diagrams and the documentation to help developers visualize how things are arranged in applications when they're using the page router API. Let's see. And that that's the that's the process that I used for designing the page router API. I hope that was enlightening. Let's see. Uh, Uh, do, do we have any uh, questions that need answering? Let's see.